So pal, a while back, we were cleaning out a warehouse of yours and I found a box that had a bunch of old race trophies. They were trophies that had uh, cars on the top of them and those uh, at the, the trophies had stickers on them that said NASCAR drag racing. And I wasn't aware of anything about NASCAR drag racing before. But what's the story on that? How did that come to be? Well, most people don't remember that or don't never knew that NASCAR had got into the sanction of drag racing. Uh, we used to have a, a bunch of guys running around here, we were drag racing, and uh, we formed a little club, and we would go out and uh, race at the Flagler County Airport. Uh, it was uh, just a bare airport at the time. And so we were working on reg regular racing there, and then uh, through a series of uh, events, we uh, came across with when NASCAR needed to have a place to run their race race. So uh, we made a little deal with them and so the NASCAR found, formed the NASCAR Timing Association to sanction these tra tracks and I became the chief steward for the NASCAR Timing Association. I was starting to start a drag race. I tried short track racing here and there and I never had, uh, you know, the any money as everybody always says but I did also didn't have any talent so I get together it didn't uh, work pretty good for not being a racer but uh, anyway I started doing drag racing we started doing drag racing up in Flagler Beach on the Flagler uh, uh, on the airport and at the airport at the end there was no bu no buildings no fa fences no nothing it was just the strips and high grass because uh, the Navy had used that little training base and they had just abandoned it after the war. And they uh, left it. So we used it for a while and the people got to complain and the county made us take a lease on it. So our little hot rod club uh, called the King's Men, uh, we took a lease on it. And of course some of them wasn't old enough or anything, but I, I was uh, 21. There was a couple others that were 21, so they we we leased the airport, and uh, we would uh, every other Sunday or so uh, we would have a regular drag races, and uh, there was a club in Daytona called the Beach Angels, and they would come up and race with us, and we had guys coming down from St. Augustine uh, and uh, from Jacksonville, and uh, you know, and we'd we'd get 50 or 100 cars out there, and. Uh, that's how we got started into that of it. About uh, during that time, I, I had a 50 Chevrolet Bel Air, and uh, it was almost brand new. And I'd read written in a Hot Rod magazine about them probably putting a GMC engine in it. And they had a little article in there about how to do that. So I studied out to do that, and I went to the junkyard and I bought me a big GMC uh, truck engine. And we we the, uh, we you know cleaned up and did the head work and you know did all the little minor things that we do to make it right and uh, tried to put it in. Well, that was a real job. And jo Walt Everhardt, the mechanic, uh, was helping me on this it, at the garage there, and I worked for him part time and got to be a fairly decent mechanic. But anyway, we put that motor in. Well, it was a job, and we ended up taking the radiator out and turning it around and putting away part of the grill so it would fit further and make, make, making motor mounts, and it was, I mean, really, if it had, he hadn't been a master at work, we wouldn't have done it. But we got it in, and uh, I took it to the drag strip, and it wouldn't run, worth a darn. It just absolutely wouldn't wind up and wouldn't run good. And we did everything that we could think of it to make it run, and we never could. So, uh, Marshall Teague uh, had a little shop in a metal building down at the airport in Daytona. Now, then the, there was no ramps or anything. The planes had to have a ladder uh, to go up and down to get into them, and there was only one or two planes they come in there, and there was no Emory Riddle School, and there wasn't anything out there but just a few planes. And this metal building that had several shops in it, and Marshalls was there, so I signed, saved up a little money and decided I'd get Marshall to take a look at it. 
So I went in there because he didn't know me from, you know, John saw. And I walked in and told him what I had. And, and uh, he said, boy, he said, you hadn't got no engine in that engine, GMP engine in there. He said, somebody has ripped you off. And I said, well, no, I, I, I put it in there. I took it out of the truck and put it in there. He said, you know, I don't think you could do, you can't do that. He said, uh, I know really good mechanics in, in, in North Carolina who have been doing that and trying to make them for short tracks. And he said, they hadn't been able to do that. And I said, well, I bought the truck engine and took it out of the truck. And I put it in there with, with a buddy of mine. And so he went over to it and he looked at it and he looked at the serial number and then he crowned underneath it and then one thing and another. He said, well, I'll be damned. He said, you know, you, you've got one in there. So then he was fascinated then. So he, he went to looking at how he had fixed the, the motor mounts and so forth and everything. And uh, so he uh, said, well, what do, you, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, it won't run. So he got the timing light and was out and looking at it. And, and he said, well, you're all, your, your cam's off and your, your timing's off and everything. So valves need to set different. So he worked on it for about an hour, hour and a half. And when we cramped it, cranked it up, and it, you could just hear the difference. And uh, I went out there on the back on where the rips runway was at the uh, airport, and make a run on it, and that sucker would really go. It would just really dig right off. So we come back in, and we were standing there looking at it, and he was tinkling, and Fireball Roberts come in. You know, well I knew Glenn a little bit because I talked talk to him on the beach and everything, but. Uh, when we were in high school, uh, he had been uh, on the uh, junior football site team for Mainland. And uh, our school in Bunnell, I was on the, the Mainland uh, team. They only had one, but our, that was one of our prizes. So I knew him slightly and uh, to speak to and everything. And uh, anyway, he come out and uh, and Marshall told him what I had, and he just said, oh, good night. And so they, we cranked it up, and it, uh, it sounded good. And he said, I want to run it, and help, you know, help yourself. And so he jumped in it, and he went out there on the runway, and he kind of gestured a few times, and come back. Well, that old Chevy had a 411, the stout 411 rear end in it, so it was a really low gear. And so he... Uh, he jumped on that thing and he started and the tires lit up. It was like they, you know, doing this burnout in that NASCAR modern days. It was no coming out of there, just couldn't see it, you know. He made a run, must, must have run 100 feet with it, all blowing smoke, making tires just going. And he got his foot off of it finally and, and it slowed back down and he come back in and, and we, they were all amazed. and. So, and I was too, and I was just proud as punch, and uh, I had a bad car, you know, and so uh, that's the way I got uh, really involved with, with Marshall and Fireball in it. So, went back and uh, got to be fairly, fairly successful at drag racing it, and uh, so uh, we had, uh, like I say, every two weeks we'd have a, a race race there. And just mostly all locals and from Jacksonville and, and a few from and, uh, St. Augustine and, and uh, Palatka and so forth come over. So about that time, uh, Ed Otto came to work or came to into NASCAR. And the story was that NASCAR really needed some money and Otto had some or had access to it. And anyway, they made him a vice president of NASCAR. And Otto liked drag racing. He loved it. And he had been promoting drag racing, uh, you know, up in uh, New Jersey and around. And uh, so he convinced Bill that they should have a drag race on the beach. And I didn't go to it. It was a, uh, a late evening or uh, thing. But it was a disaster. They didn't have any pavement to go on, to work on, and I don't know what all went wrong, but anyway, they cut it easy, shot, and people who had paid to pin it was mad, and so they had some kind of a miniature riot, riot down in Daytona, and uh, 
they were all around the main street and the bars and so forth. The main street in those days was a, a live wire place year round anyway. And uh, so anyway, I don't know, but it was in the paper and everything. They had to, uh, had to call out, they called out the fire department that was going to uh, uh, calm down the, the riot, rioters. And uh, as they pulled the rug out, or well, people chopped the, ho the hose up so they couldn't do that. And it was real bad, bad paper that had a big on it. And of course, it wasn't much on TV in those days. So they, But uh, Bill just didn't like any kind of bad publicity, any kind. So they decided, uh, Bill France, uh, so they, they uh, decided that they better find some other place to do So they come up to Flagler Beach to Flagler County, and uh, but we had to tied up the railroad track, the, the airport, and uh, so he had to, to deal with us. So they made it. We made a deal. Bill found a little company called uh, uh, Flagler Racing Enterprises, and uh, Flagler Racing Enterprises had uh, had Ed Otto and a man named Jack Sin, who was editor of the. NASCAR newsletter and a couple of three others. I don't remember who they are right now, but Ed Otto was the, the head guy. So uh, they uh, came up and ran, wined us and dined us, and he took my wife and I to uh, a place called a King's Inn, King's Cellar, I guess it was. It was supposed to be at that time the nicest restaurant in town. And, and never could have been gone to it, but he had us there and, and had us a lot of steak and that, that, and the other. And uh, so we signed up to, to run the races for him. So we were going to run the racetrack and uh, they would do some promotion on it and so forth. And they bought or rented two gigantic World War II searchlights. I mean, these things were like 10 or 12 feet in diameter the lens and they brought them up there and built a stand for them and they run them down the strip so that it was that the lab, lab uh, drag strip was illuminated by these huge uh, searchlights and so we they put the word out and of course there was a lot of people down there well we right off the bat we had you know a couple of thousand people showed up and we had several hundred drivers, so it was successful. But it got cold. Uh, that was a record cold. That one night that we ran, it was 17 degrees, and people were building fires, standing around, and, and there wasn't any fences or safety fences. We had a little like a, a plastic rope running up for people to stand behind, and uh, we ran the races and got through about 2:30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, so we ran, uh, I think it was five nights. When they, but they, they started. Them, they, what they did was they made it a NASCAR division. They made NASCAR timing division, which was going to be. Uh, uh, they were going to try to do a franchise or you know, uh, uh, use it to uh, sanction other tracks. So uh, I got to be made the uh, chief steward of uh, the NASCAR timing division. Well, it was such a success, the, the our drag strip, that at the end of the time, they brought in another guy named Dee McGrath, who had been a uh, champion midget driver and done some NASCAR racing. And uh, they brought him in as co-chief steward. So the two of us were both red running NASCAR drag racing. And uh, so, uh, but the regular races was a big success. The night drags were a big success, and uh, so we set up to do sanctioning. So we ran the Flagler strip as a NASCAR uh, track, and we finally set up one in Titusville, the Titusville uh, airport. And uh, we went two or three others. We went to South Georgia one time and ran a race at uh, Thomasville, Georgia, which was a, a story in itself and uh, kind of put a uh, unique situation. But anyway, uh, we went up there, took a whole club and everything, and Steve and I, and we uh, um, 
had that race. So we come back and so we had through that year we ran we had several tracks that we had signed up, and uh, so as the chief steward, I was uh, one of the ones we would go. Steve or I would go to whatever track was, and we were responsible for the uh, for the uh, pit pass money, and uh, and any type of you know cut we were supposed to have the NASCAR was supposed to have, and so uh, that's how I really got involved. Of course, in doing that, you got to know, know uh, Bill and all the office. Anyway, we'd take the money down from Miss Annie, and she would count the money. And she ran everything. Miss Annie was was the heart and soul of, of NASCAR. Bill was a genius at running the, running the show and dealing with people. Miss Annie made sure that money was made and money was paid, and uh, she had uh, a real small staff. In those days, you could probably count all of NASCAR's employees on one hand, or at least two hands. Uh, Joe Epton was the chief quote uh, chief uh, uh, scorer, but he did everything. He had an old truck with a Donald Duck picture on the side of it, a stamp panel truck, and he used to hang uh, haul stuff down onto the beach. He brought all the speakers and so forth up for us for the drag strip and everything and uh, he was a right a right right hand man and uh, his wife was named Lightning Epton and Lightning helped Miss Amy, Amy and she did all the money helped with the money and the tickets and different things and Lightning is today still works at the Speedway she's over 90 years old I saw her just the other day. We had, uh, had was eating together, and uh, and she still works at the Speedway, and she's a, a formidable person. There's six, six or eight hundred people working there, but Miss uh, uh, Lightning gets done whatever she wants to get done. At any rate, all through that year we were doing, you know, running little drag strips. So it came time to uh, do the the. Uh, night drags again in uh, February. So Ed Otto, we had run the whole thing before, but Otto showed up with a bunch of uh, New Jersey guys uh, and they were going to handle the money. They were going to take all the, do the, the, stack, uh, the uh, ticket sales and all like that. They were going to handle the money, uh, except that I was going to still be in charge of the Pit-pass money because that was NASCAR, and uh, but we didn't trust them, so we put counters, got people there right where the cars would come in and people were selling tickets. We put pe uh, some of our club members there with the uh, clickers, and uh, it wasn't long. But the first night we found out that about one in three wasn't maybe getting getting paying or was paying, but the money wasn't going in the, the, the coffer. And uh, so I went to Otto and talked to him, and he said we were mistaken and so forth. And uh, anyway, we ran, but I was in, you know, we were really involved in having to run the thing, and uh, which was, you know, organized chaos. And uh, so anyway, uh, it went up to again, and it was really big success. And uh, when it got through, they were supposed to pay us a percentage or a certain amount of money. To the club for the use of the the strip and everything. Well, our kids didn't pay, wasn't paid anything. And I wasn't paid anything. Uh, we just all did it for the for the club and what was happening. And uh, so uh, for the, the drag drags with us, so uh, they never paid us when they wouldn't pay us. And Otto kept saying no, he wouldn't pay us. And well, he just he didn't say he wouldn't pay us. He just wouldn't. So I found uh, a, an attorney I knew of named Nick Caputo, and uh, he sent them notice that he was filing suit and uh, to collect the money. Well, Bill France was just vivid, livid. He he's uh, you know always wanted to be up and up and have everything going and have somebody sue him for not paying him. He was really mad. Although it was Otto, he never really had anything to do 
just with the air with the drag racing, except just look at it over and talk about it now and then. But uh, it was all Otto's deal. So uh, anyway, uh, Otto and them said they, they they were gonna fight it. But Bill got to hold of uh, the NASCAR uh, attorney who was Louis Osinski, and Louis Osinski had been the original attorney who set up NASCAR. And uh, in fact, he hadn't taken a, uh, a fee for that. He had took st uh, stock in NASCAR. And so he was a, a, a stockholder and he had NASCAR's, uh, uh, was really at, at heart to him too. But he said, boy, what's wrong? We always said, y'all pay these boys. These kids got need to make money and, and they work for it. And so uh, uh, Bill had them to pay us. But of course, it was to look like, well, uh, we had sued him because we had to sue all, everybody that was in Florida Flag Racing Enterprises. Well, and that was right at the start of Speed Weeks, and, uh, or it just was about that time. Well, I couldn't get in a, into a racetrack with a ticket. I mean, I was the, the man who sued the Francis and so forth. And, uh, so, uh, but one time, during, they had to, NASCAR had, Auto had uh, drag races on the back stretch at Daytona. And uh, I wanted to go, and my wife and I went, and uh, there was a guy named Murray Pendleton who was worked for NASCAR part-time. He was a, uh, an amputee, amputee. He had lost both, both legs in the World War II, and he had some braces, and he would... Uh, get around and he had to walk like step legged but he was a really nice guy but he did everything under the sun and it needed to be done he was a go go getter do everything and uh, he was like keys people would lock the cars and the uh, keys in the cars at the racetrack he could jimmy the doors to get them out and he would get records to pull out people that was broke or jump people batteries off and stuff like that so Murray was had a NASCAR, a Dodge NASCAR station wagon, big signs on it and all the paraphernalia and decals. And so he said, well, I'll take you in the drag strip. So Jenny and I got in the car and he took us right through. Of course, they didn't stop for his credentials or anything, or tickets, because they saw us going through. So we were down there, and ride, mostly riding around in the car. But of course, we, we got out with so because we knew all the people who were drag racing and all the drag racers, and we knew all the officials, and they were all, you know, buddies. And uh, and they were keeping an eye out for anybody that would be opposed to us. So somebody told Otto that we were there. And uh, so we got in the car and back in the station wagon, and Murray started hurting. We went around the track to try to get out of gate seven. Which is under the grandstand, and uh, but it was locked, and it was you know 11 or 12 o'clock at night, so we had to come back and go through the main gate to get out on the back stretch, and uh, they had to, Otto had the guards looking for us and security and everything, but we got it to go out. But that's the last time that I went knew anything about that. So uh, at that point, uh, we I was through with NASCAR as far as that looked like, and I went to uh, went to Miami. I met a bunch of people that was uh, running the drags, uh, running dragsters, and uh, at the drag strip, and got to be good buddies with them. And uh, his name was Floyd Albritton, and we had a built a, a dragster. It was uh, really ugly. It was nasty looking, and it was painted with white, white uh, house paint, and we'd scratch it to make sure it really looked bad. And uh, so, uh, but it would really run, and he won everything at uh, two years down there, up there. So I went down there and kind of opened a little business. I had a garage and, and service station, and uh, I would go and we'd go drag racing. And so that was our what I was doing down there. And uh, so we had a sponsor, Hal DuPont, uh, one of the DuPont family, and he was a sponsor. He raced against Floyd. In a, in a modified coupe class, and no matter what he could do, he couldn't beat him. And he went up and had Jim Rathman build the engines for him, and Floyd, we, we still put him on the trailer. So he decided he would race anymore, but he sponsored our car. So uh, we uh, 
we would go to a drag race, we'd rent a car, uh, usually a convertible, and we'd pull the dragster on a, on, a, on a trailer, and he would give us our uh, gas money and give us a supply of the rental car, and so we could go drag racing around the different ones that was available at that time. But anyway, I was uh, I was drag racing, and that uh, uh, was the end of the NASCAR timing division because after about two more years, it just kind of petered out, and uh, Otto was no longer with NASCAR, and he was the the uh, the, uh, the driver behind that because Bill just did not like drag racing. Thank <laughs> you.